All right, everybody, welcome back to Bruce's Bees. I have a special guest on uh, today. His name is Rainier Ike. I guess is that how you say it, Rainier? Rainier Ike. Rainier Ike. Okay. Well, you got me there. So now I know Rainier Ike. And uh, I grew up, uh, my dad was from Washington State. And so, you know, it's spelled the same way as Matt Rainier in Washington. So I thought that was interesting. It's a interesting name. And um, I think as you continue to do great things in beekeeping, that name will become a household name in beekeeping. I do believe that. So Rainier introduced himself to me at the uh, beekeeping conference in Sevierville uh, two years ago. It was really nice to meet you. And, and I guess you started your channel about then, didn't you, Rainier? Uh, yeah, I posted like, other than my Hive Life application video, I posted my first video on like the 21st of January or 20th. Yeah. And I want to tell folks, don't let the young face um fool you this this kid right here has a lot of knowledge in beekeeping uh much more than many of the people that have been doing it for years that i know and i'm very impressed with your knowledge the fundamentals that you have just in in what you teach on your channel uh the name of your channel is reindeers bees right yeah so that's kind of a cool channel and and rainier is from maine so a little different take here uh extreme northeast united states you know, so much of beekeeping is, is regional, but also so much of it, the basics, you know, are the same wherever you are. The, the timing of things is what matters most, I think, in different regions, but the basic fundamentals are the same. It's just a matter of how you time everything and, and how you do things in your particular area. So uh, I'd like to kind of uh, let you take a couple of minutes, Rainier, and introduce yourself, uh, talk a little bit about your beekeeping experience, your history, how long you've been doing it, and uh, just kind of what your operation's like and, and a little bit about where you plan to go in the future, just to take a, maybe a condensed version, Reader's Digest version. So I started beekeeping back in 2018. Um, I've been, I grew up on a farm. Uh, we moved to Maine when I was seven years old and my grandparents owned a farm and I'd gone up there when I was a kid. So I've always been involved in ag and uh, my mom knew I'd love beekeeping. So she said, hey, Rainier, do you want to go to bee class with me? And I said, okay. <laughs> so I went with her way back in 2018 and like I just fell in love with it instantly and have been obsessed with it ever since. I went from, you know, one colony in 2018 to now 18 hives. And uh, I, I did it mostly um, with my mother the first year. And ever since she's been doing, you know, uh, occupational therapy school, among other things. So I've been mainly doing uh, beekeeping on my own. I just love every part of beekeeping and I hope to grow this into like a full business for myself, but uh, I'm not Seth Hill. So I don't want to go from, you know, like eight to 80 in one year or anything. I want to slowly build up as I learn from other commercial beekeepers. So I would suspect that I need around 200 to 250 colonies. And uh, that's for my location. I'm, I'm here in mid coast, Maine. Um, so we're not considered Southern Maine. We're not uh, down East, which is actually in Maine, we call it, uh, which is technically Northern Maine. So we're kind of in the middle of the state near the coast. So we get colder temperatures, but it's not like super cold, like some parts of the Northern part of the state towards the Canadian border. We're about five hours from the border where I live. And I'm hoping, uh, you know, 200, 250 colonies, something like that. And I hope to work for a commercial beekeeping company about an hour North of me. Hopefully that should start when I graduate in June, I'm, I'm a senior in high school. So that's kind of my rough idea. And to this point, I've sold around 50 or 60 queens over the past three years. And I started, I failed on my first attempt in, of grafting in 2020, but since then, in 2021 and on, I've you know grafted many queens and sold some. I've sold, I've harvested 190 pounds of honey in 2023. In 2022, I harvested uh, 230 pounds. So we have some honey here. It's pretty poor location in general, but oh, that can be a part um, because to be a commercial beekeeper, you need you know multiple income streams. So honey can be part of that, and we have a lot of tourists to sell our honey to. So you know I'd like to sell some honey. It's probably my least favorite part. And with queens, hopefully I can get it dialed in better so it's more enjoyable. But I think I'll end up selling bees in the future. Um, but so far, I've mostly sold honey and queens and just tried to grow each year. I tried, uh, my goal was to get to 30 hives before winter this year. I only got to 25 and I currently have 18 left, but I think that gives you a good background on uh, what I've done here and where I am. One thing about, about your channel that I've been impressed with is just like I mentioned earlier, I think the fundamentals that, you know, I mean, you have a great understanding of the importance of feeding, treating, you know, you've already been making some queens. Um, and so you've, you're really kind of ahead of the game and, and there are a few, uh, young 
beekeepers out there that are doing some similar things. You know, Natalie and uh, you know, Grayson's working on his beekeeping thing as well, as well as some others. I'm not, I don't want to leave anybody out, but I've just been really impressed with how you explain things in your channel and just the actual beekeeping knowledge that you have. Um, so I think you're headed in the right direction. Are there a lot of beekeepers up there, especially like on the commercial scale, or is it is it because it seems like it would be kind of with the extreme temperature and weather, it seems like it would be difficult to to be a commercial beekeeper in Maine. Well, it's beautiful, so you should come up and visit sometime, Bruce. But uh, here, here in Maine, we have a ton of hobbyist beekeepers, infinite amounts of them. As far as commercial beekeepers go, there are a fair amount. So I would guess, I mean, I could name you four or five different ones within a couple hours of me, one or two hours. So it is, there are commercial beekeepers in Maine, and largely that is due to our, um, I would say booming or growing hobby market. Um, so we, you know, nukes cost around at least 200 to $250 here in Maine and our packages aren't cheap either. So it's, there's a lot of market for those in Queens as well. I mean, I was selling my Queens for 45 to $50 per queen and I didn't, I didn't have endless demand, but decent demand. And I've only got my name out there for a couple of years. So there are a fair amount of beekeepers, um, hobbyist and commercial alike. And, it, more than the cold wet winters, like if you do everything right during the summer and, you know, like I said, like you were describing, if you treat, you feed and the hives are large going into the, the winter time, even in our extreme colonies, uh, bees are really good at making it through winter since they evolved in Europe and Asia, where in parts they're quite cold, uh, some of them, they're really good at making it through long cold winters. And I had two or three hives where I was being a bad beekeeper and I didn't put rocks on top and the covers blew off. And for a month, there was just an inner cover on top of the box and all three of those hives are still alive. You know, it's just wild what the bees can do if they're healthy. Um, we do have some colder weather during the winter um, in a shorter season, but because I live near the coast, we don't have nearly the temperature swings the, during the summer when it's, it's hotter inland. And during the winter, it's also colder inland, but since the temperature, the ocean water stays roughly the same temperature year round, it moderates us. So like a lot of people inland will get snow and won't get rain during the winter, for example. So we have a, obviously a lot colder than Alabama. We don't, I don't do my first inspection till mid April and I'm not in my bees probably last inspection in late September, early October. But overall, like as long as you do all of those right things during that short season, which that is one of the challenges is you have much less time to do everything. But if you're able to, then they can make it through the six months of cold. Uh, tell me if you could name the top three things that you that you want to emphasize in order of importance or just the top three things that you think are important in beekeeping, what would those three things be? I'd probably go uh, equalizing, testing slash treating for mites, and then feeding. So those those are the big three for me, for sure. Okay, well, let's dive into that. When you say equalizing, right. what do you mean and how do you do it? I, I just think that equalizing is the ultimate time saver. You're spending possibly more time in the hive at the moment, but you're saving yourself from doing future work. So my first inspection in mid-April, I go through all the hives and I'm still figuring the exact amount of frames of brood that I want them to have. But roughly what my guess is for mid-April, when I typically am able to do my first inspection, I go through every hive and pull them down to three to four frames of brood. So if, if one has five to six, which would be a lot, I... I pull those frames out and I give them into the weaker colonies and the ones that are at one or two, I'm boosting them up to three or four. And then I also am equalizing honey stores. So I want to make sure that every hive has at least two frames of honey uh, in mid April, probably ideally more like three or four. So I'm just trading frames and that just saves me so much time uh, in the long run because I don't have to deal with nearly as much swarming. And I'm doing the same thing on all my colonies at the same time because they're the same size. You can't get complete uniformity because some queens are better than others and they're diff some yards are different than others and there's a lot of factors, but you can, you can make your time so much more effective by making an intentional effort to get them all to the same size at the same time. Okay. So what was the second thing? Uh, uh, treating? Testing slash treating. Yeah. Testing slash treating. Okay. What do you do for that? So I want to... I. Did this a little bit last year, but I want to get more into it this year. I don't know if you've seen Zach Lamas's research on um, mites being on the drones. So I'd like to do some drone alcohol washes or, you know, I, I use Dawn typically early in that early spring period, because what his research showed was that the mites really prefer the drones uh, on adult bees. We knew they preferred reproducing in drone cells, but they also 
much prefer to be on adult drone bees. And so the mites, once they hatch on a drone, they jump to another young drone, to another young drone, into, an, uh, into another cell in the middle of the colony. They stay right in the middle. And so I did this a little bit last year, but I'd pick up 30 drones, throw them in some uh, alcohol or, you know, Dawn soap wash and just wash them for mites. And we don't have hard thresholds for that yet, but you, if you, you know, test most of your colonies or some of your colonies, you can get a sense of, uh, and compare them to each other. And so I, I've tested in early May where our season really starts to get going, but I always roll zeros. So that's, that's something I want to incorporate. But as far as normal alcohol washes, I typically do those in mid to late, starting in mid to late June. If they've got honey supers on, it's pretty tough. If you, you know, they, if I have to pull off 90 pounds of honey every hive to test them, I'm probably going to wait till I pull honey, which is typically the second week of July. And our flow really starts to slow down around the 4th of July or 10th of July. In the past, I've tested, been able to have the time to test every single colony. But as beekeepers grow, most of them switch to just do, testing a certain percent of the apiary. And so doing those tests in mid-July, really important for me. Then uh, I'll treat and then do a, another uh, test post-treatment typically. So that would be around the 1st of August. And then assuming that they don't test too high, then I'll wait another three to four weeks, get another test in in late August, early September, well, around the time where our fall flow is going to start. And then I get one last treatment on for the year and then uh, hopefully test them post-treatment and they should be clean. That's so... I guess if you count that, that'd be one, two, three, at least four mite tests a year, maybe, maybe even five. And so that's how I kind of like deal with the mite pressure, which I don't know how it's worked out for you, but I seem to be having less mites and them doing more damage. So I don't think that, I think that's something that's relatively similar for a lot of beekeepers I've heard from that, you know, it, for whatever reason, it seems to be getting worse and I'm not really sure why that is. You know, one thing I see a lot is, is, um, I'll have a, a bee yard that has 20 colonies and I'll have two that have above threshold and then the rest are one or two, zero in a regular traditional wash. Uh, one thing I think it'd be interesting, uh, Rainier, if you could do it, it would be to um, do a comparison. You may think about this already, like do some colonies like, you know, designate yeah. five colonies for the drone might wash and five colonies for the standard might wash and do them at the same time. See if you notice yeah. that there's more mites actually in the drones. I know theoretically that's the case and I've heard, I haven't read that research in a lot, but it would be interesting to see what you come up with and, and you might be a, the, I'm sure they've done that. That's probably what their study is all about, but in your own situation, that would be kind of cool to see if you have those results as well, or if you see that it's similar in both. What type of treatments do you do when you decide to treat your bees? Uh, I've traditionally, I've used a lot of formic and oxalic during the winter when they're broodless. This year, for the first time, I used some apivar because of the bees being too weak for formic. I mean, as you were testing last spring, you need, you need pretty strong bees to use formic effectively and to not kill the hive. So I've used a lot of formic over the years, but I'm trying to get more into the rotation of my treatments just to you know prevent any future possibility of resistance. So I use some apivar, mostly used formic and used oxalic during the winter time. I, I used to have a mentor closer to me and she would... Um, treat my hives for me. But since then I haven't had a vaporizer, but I'm about to buy one again so I can reincorporate that into my uh, plan. And I, I'm, I'm interested in using Apigard potentially, but I'm trying to figure out how that would be possible because I'm worried about the upper treatment temperature threshold, because if I do the lower dose treatment, it would be too long of a treatment to add my honey supers back on in the fall after I've pulled them in the summer. So I'm kind of interested in it, but it may just temperature wise not be possible to do the lower dose um, if I wanna add honey super sting in the fall. That's what I've done in the past. And hopefully I'm, you know, breeding, you know, integrating the mite resistance into my stock. So like, it would be a dream world if I just had to treat with oxalic during the winter when they're broodless, like that would be great if I could get to that result. Typically in a regular summer, what are, how hot does it get there during the hottest part of the summer? So last year was an outlier year, but I think we got one or two days above 90 degrees. So it was a really cool year because it was raining the whole time. But on an average year, we can get some, a few weeks of the year that are, I would say 90 or above and very, very humid. Like we're talking, you know, South kind of type level of humidity. Uh, so it's not, it's not super hot, nor is it very cold either. I mean, it's, we still get into the nineties and eighties typically. I think our average temperature, like in, uh, February, it's like, 
highs of 32 degrees and lows of like 17. So it doesn't feel that cold to me, but of course I've been here all winter. So I'm, I'm going to say that, but our summers are relatively warm, but you know, nothing near what you guys have. And then also in July, uh, our hottest day of the year is like July 30th. So we're all getting cooler past that point. Yeah. I mean, I know you've been to Alabama before, but I, you know, yeah. humidity is something that we're very familiar with down here. And especially in the summertime, you get into uh, July, August, September, it's absolutely miserable down here with the humidity and it's, you know, 95 degrees and 98% humidity. It's just ridiculous. And the people yeah. aren't happy. The bees aren't happy. <laughs> animals aren't happy. Nobody's happy, but you just got to live with it and swat the mosquitoes away and just, just deal with it. So um, it's always absolutely. fun. When we were at the Bee Expo, uh, we talked to Cameron Jack some about the research he's doing at the University of Florida with oxalic acid vapor. I guess they did four different treatment intervals times four treatments. In other words, I think one was seven days, one was like five days, then two days. And then anyway, they they broke it up into three different or four different uh, groups, test groups, mm -hmm. or it may have been three different test groups and a control group. I'm not sure. But what, you know, in Florida, there's uh, never a time when the bees are completely broodless to speak of just like it is here in Alabama. Very rarely do we have a colony that's completely broodless and you kind of wonder if something's wrong if that's the case. I have had some Carniolans slash Caucasians that brooded way, way down and almost broodless in the winter time. But typically we have some brood throughout the winter. And so in order to treat with oxalic acid vapor, you know, it's kind of a concern because you all, I've always heard that it's not effective unless the bees are broodless. But the study they did in Florida, according to Cameron Jack, they found that if they do four consecutive treatments, five to seven days apart, it's it's quite effective against uh, the mites. And so that might be something to consider. You know, oxalic acid vapor is a very, it doesn't even phase the bees one bit. It's almost like when you treat with it, initially they're kind of a little bit agitated, but just a minute or two later, if you kind of crack the lid and look in there, it's almost like they're, they're on some kind of a drug or something. They're just real mellow and just kind of chilling out. Some colonies are. So, and then within just a few minutes, it's just business as usual, like nothing even happened. You know, I have used some Formic. I started that last year a little bit, seemed to work okay. Mm -hmm. I used Apigarb one time. I didn't care for that as much. I know it's effective, but it just seems like pretty harsh as far as the smells. You know, that thymol is real strong and the bees don't like it at all. The Formic, it seemed like within a short period of time, they were kind of back to business as usual. It was pretty hard on the brood initially, but that's okay. It's a little brood break. And then the queen went right back to laying in my very brief experience with that. But my favorite two treatments have been oxalic acid vapor and Apivar. I've just had, I know some people say Apivar doesn't tend to work as well now as it used to, but I've had just tremendous success. When I treat with Apivar, it's like, it seems like they're zero to one, maybe two mite washes, you know, in the washes it's really good. I've had tremendous success with it. And so it's kind of my favorite thing in the summertime because we pull the honey supers off and the bees are, it's once again, it's that time of the year when the bees are just miserable. Everybody's miserable. Bees, people, everybody. And so yeah. if you can get those Apivar strips in there and leave them alone for six to eight weeks and then come and pull them out, that's a pretty non-invasive treatment in my opinion. Pull the honey supers off, put Apivar in and then just let it ride. But you may want to give it a try. Maybe do some testing with the oxalic acid vapor in the summertime or whatever with when there is brood and just do it in those intervals if you have time to do that if you're able to do that that is a it's a pretty um time consuming thing although it's with the instant vap it's not bad at all i mean literally less less than a minute like per treatment two grams is like 20 seconds and then if you're doing four grams it's like 35 40 seconds per treatment uh, you just figure a minute from going from hive to hives so it's very quick and it's it, by the time you you apply the formic or by the time you apply any other thing else, you probably spend more time than that. Of course, those are, you know, less intervals like Formix a one-time deal if you put two pads. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just kind of an interesting thing to, you may want to consider that. Cameron, that was some, I was really kind of stunned by that research because I originally thought Cameron was kind of opposed to oxalic acid vapor. But then when he told us that, I was pretty impressed by that to know that maybe that's why my bees, I used to use nothing but oxalic acid vapor and my bees seemed to be pretty healthy. I never checked, tested or anything. And then I got worried about it, started trying these other products. And then I just realized that, well, maybe, maybe I was doing something right back in the day. So you mentioned, um, first of all, was equalizing the colonies. Second was uh, mite control. And thirdly, you mentioned feeding. Talk a little bit about your feeding slash nutrition regimen with your bees. If we're starting, you know, from January, like the calendar year, I like to put on them. Um, some dry sugar on any hives that I, you know, I pick up the back, feel if they're light. And then at that point I will add some dry sugar on top, I, but I only do it on the hives that absolutely need it. Uh, and I, you just gain that over time by lifting the back of the hives to figure out how much weight considering the, at which, which point you are in winter. 
So that's my first feeding. Then when the crocuses bloom, which is typically mid-March to early April, that's when I put on my pollen patties. Uh, I like to give them, you know, whatever amount I deem they need. And that's dependent upon the size of the cluster. So if I have a really large colony, I might give them a full patty. The really small, like one frame clusters, I'm giving them probably like a third or a fourth of the patty so it doesn't dry out. And um, if I have any, a couple of loose hide beetles running around, they will start to reproduce in that. And then I really don't like to do spring feeding. I don't really like to feed sugar water. I just like to trade honey frames in between hives. And so that just saves time. And if I fed enough in the fall, then there's plenty of food to go around and they start to pull in nectar in late April anyway. Then I do feed all my nukes though. So I don't feed any of my large colonies in spring, but I start feeding my mating nukes in late April uh, when I make them up. And then throughout the summer to, if they need it during the honey prime honey flow, you don't necessarily, I don't necessarily feed all of them. But if, uh, if it's not quite as good as some as it is in some years i will add some sugar water and just to make sure they get as much comb drawn and are very effective uh in growing at that time period that's so important for us we need them to grow quickly in mid to late june and early july so they're appropriately sized and they have enough comb to make it through the winter time and i i haven't done enough of this yet to really talk about it too much but I want to do kind of like the, the Cayman Reynolds method where you pull your honey like right at, towards the end of the honey flow and then you just chuck on a ton of sugar water and just feed it to them heavy and give them a new box to draw foundation and pull some frames up into it. I want to get into doing that more just so I can, that way I can create combs and give them to the, some of my smaller hives that don't have enough for winter. And so that could be an effective way. And then also if I can keep those over winter use them in splits the next year, or if they're not full of sugar water, then I could use them for swarm control the next spring when I'm equalizing. Well, and then my most important feeding is in the mid to late fall. So around September 15th, 18th, 20th, somewhere in that range, I am putting as much food on all my hives as possible. And I'm just feeding them two to one, giving them probably 60 pounds of sugar-ish per hive. And I'm, I'm turning it wow. into two to one sugar water, but I'm just trying to get as much sugar water into them as possible. Try to fill up the whole box. They should be around 70 pounds. And then I feel it back towards the end to figure out if I, they need a little bit more food. So that's my most important feeding. And if I do that feeding right, I don't need to feed sugar. And I also don't, um, then I have plenty of frames for my splits in the springtime. Well, that's a lot of weight to put on those colonies. Of course, up there, I guess your winter is much longer. Down here, you almost have to get a majority of the honey off or the hive beetles become a huge problem with all yep. the extra honey. I, I've learned that the hard way. Um, a few years ago, I, I'd ordered some really uh, fancy queens from up north in Indiana, and I was really excited about it. And I, I had three colonies not far from here in the neighborhood down the hill, and a friend of mine had some bees there that I had set up. And I thought, well, I'll just let those things just pack honey, and I won't harvest honey this year. And so they had... A deep of mostly brood and then a deep, probably a deep of honey and maybe a medium of just all kinds of honey everywhere. They just really packed it in and I didn't harvest. I didn't pull the honey because I'm like, well, that's awesome. I'll just let these bees use that for winter and have it next uh, year for splits or for whatever I need it for. Went down and checked. I was going to do the splits um, a day or two later, kind of got everything set up and I was excited about it. Went down there to actually pull the splits that the queens got there and there was the hugest swarm I've ever seen up in a tree. And I think two of the colonies had absconded and one of them, they were all up there together. And one of them was in the process of it or just, just, you know, that wet, nasty high beetle slime was dripping all over everything. I'd never seen that before. That was, I think my second, maybe my third year keep keeping bees. I learned my lesson the hard way down here in the South. You just need to pull most of the honey and, but they don't need near as much to make it through winter either. Usually if a soup, if there's a super of honey on, typically that's pretty good, but you've seen Mike Berry probably go through and I do the same thing, go through and just like you say, lift the back of the hives, make sure there's weight in there. And uh, if there's plenty of weight, then you can just kind of leave them alone. There's usually a decent fall flow down here too. So, but typically the hive beetles start to back off when it starts to get cooler and the bees are, are bringing in that large, a lot of cotton around here, cotton, honey, also goldenrod, all the typical, all the things, right? The fall flows. Most years I'll bring a good uh, amount of honey in the fall that I just let them keep for the winter. And then uh, this year I've probably fed more than ever. Um, and I'm kind of working through my videos now trying to explain this, but Tyler Walker is a young commercial guy. He started keeping bees about the same time he did. He started in 2018 and now he's a commercial guy. He's, I think he's 30, got a young family and he just went full time. Uh, a less, mm -hmm. little less than a year ago, he's got, I think he runs well over a thousand, maybe like 1500 colonies now. Wow. 
he is just super knowledgeable, super efficient, and very good at what he does. What I'm doing is kind of following his pattern. I, I went and got some syrup from him yesterday, actually some corn syrup, which I know that's, you're not supposed to do that according to a lot of people, but it works really good well. <laughs> so I went and got some uh, syrup from him. He had had a, a tanker that had come in and we talked to him in, uh, for a while about it. And he said, look, just, you know, the splits you did last week, go ahead and, and they need to go in a 10 frame box. That's what I was doing today. He said, go ahead and feed them. There is a little flow going, but go ahead and feed them, build them up, fill up that box and then slap a queen excluder on there or, you know, then start making yeah. honey. They'll, they'll maximize out in time for honey. And uh, even the splits I'm going to make next week with sales, he's like, just feed, feed, feed. And then when they hit that, that full 10 frame box, when it's ready to go, then, you know, stop feeding and put the, the drawn comb on there to make honey. I've used a lot of fondant this year. Have you ever used the, any type of fondants like the Hive Alive fondant or anything like that? I just haven't found any reason to. I haven't really messed with it at all. I, I see a lot of people use it, but it's just, for me, the most basic and easy thing is just to buy a bag of sugar at the store. And I don't really need that much of it, just a, a couple of colonies. Um, and that was even, yeah. I started feeding way too late and I still got nearly all the colonies up to the appropriate weight where they're still, you know, 50 yeah. plus pounds right now. So I, I mean, nothing, nothing against it. Just haven't needed it. I really believe it's, it's helped save some of my clients that were on the verge of starving because with the warm weather down here, they can go from having plenty of food to no food very quickly. If you're in a rainy period in the winter or early spring, you know, or if it's just super warm but there's no flow going they can just crash in a hurry because they build up so quickly with every little thing as you know bees when that first bloom hits of any kind man it stimulates because they want to work and so in january our red maples start to bloom here and and from that point on they never brood they never go completely dormant they never brew completely down but boy when that first red maple comes in it's like they just explode i mean Im Im immediately and then we have some periods of time every spring it seems like where there's somewhat of a dearth or there's just not they're just not bringing much in and so i found that the uh fine that has helped me some and I, I didn't even use anything like that until just a couple of years ago after the conference and i tried some around then or and i was really I, th I thought it went well so the bees really love it and it works well but but you gotta i mean i know a lot of people use the sugar dry sugar some people use sugar bricks you know different ways there are major so many different ways to do things and as greg burns says there are no absolutes so talk to me about the traits that you really like to see in your queens and uh, where are you at as far as reaching your goals the type of queens that you are producing yes yeah, so i'm looking for more of a stock the carniolan russian uh blanking on the other one but uh carniolan, caucasian russian caucasian there you go yeah uh i'm breeding towards those kinds of bees um i actually send in a genomic like sample so i'll get to know exactly what my bees are at least in one apiary so that'll be interesting to see but i want bees that brood down really quickly after the honey flow ends and just have a small amount of brood in august and september and go go brood this by you know early october what that does is it just saves me feeding uh we don't have a lot of honey flow for a lot of our summer we have a decent amount of dearth considering how the length of our season so I rather have my bees shut down. And so instead of feeding them 60 pounds of sugar, if I could feed them 35 pounds of sugar or 40 pounds of sugar, that makes a lot of sense time, time wise and money wise. So I want to breed towards those bees that gear down uh, early after the flow. And then I want the bees that they have a little bit of brood, you know, all of February. And then the first pollen hits in late March, and then they just take off and explode. And they only need, you know, a couple bees on every frame to keep the brood warm. So I want that explosive growth late and the early early stopping after the honey flow brooding down quickly that's that's what's important to me because of my feeding situation and i it also i mean technically it helps with mites too just having less brood uh less less of the year for the mites to build up slowly with the bees that's kind of what i'm looking for in my queens and then i also want to breed in the the vsh um low overall growth you know some form of that resistance into my population and that's obviously in the very early stages i'm just going to start testing this year and i'd say i'm only part maybe part way to getting my bees to that kind of shut down early uh wait late into spring till they get going i had one colony though that was like really a poster child of this they had like one frame of brood in mid-April and then I checked back like 15 days later and they had like four and a half frames of brood or something and that's with nights in the like the 30s uh in late April so they were just exploding and so fast uh, so that's that's what I'm looking for in my queens yeah I don't know how they do that I've had a few carnelo and slash you know, I had some Greg's queens you know Greg Burns does the Caucasians 
And uh, I've had some carniolans in the past. It's amazing. They'll have just, you think they're going to die. Like a softball size, a little cluster of bees. You're like, well, these bees are goners. And then you come back two weeks later and the whole deep box is full. And you're like, how's that even possible? Um, so it is really cool to see that. The danger we have down here, I think, is just, just the, those darn hive beetles and pests that get in them throughout the year. And so, you know, I went and bought a bunch of uh, Cordovan slash Italian queens from Hawaii. I just used those Opposite. last week. Yeah. Most of my feral bees around here do do pretty well with the mites i think they 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 keep the numbers pretty low you have one sometimes that wash pretty high but um they're super rugged and tough bees but they're just a lot of them are just daggum spicy and it's just a little bit not super fun to work them sometimes and so that's why i'm kind of trying to introduce some other stuff from the outside that i know is going to be calmer and a combination of that with the local genetics hopefully if i can do some queen breeding myself here kind of get in the groove of doing that maybe i can develop a bee that's kind of got the best of both worlds and i don't mind them building up quickly here in the springtime i mean We've got something coming in now. It's not like just pouring in the hives, but in some of my areas, like in Slocum, right before I got in here with you, you know, I told you I was going to be late because I, I'd started cracking those hives open and they were, there's yeah. white wax galore in those things. I mean, they're just packing in those new splits. I mean, full of white wax, building comb in the top of my, got a little space, you know, in the top of some of my nukes, they were building comb all up in there. And I just checked them last week when I, you know, when I checked on those queens. And so there, there's something going on. And then in other areas, there's nothing really going on right now. So it's just crazy within my little region right here, how that works. I have actually a very similar story. It, it's even more crazy than that, though. I have someone who lives 10 minutes away from me. Well, actually, two different um, examples of this, but he has a goldenrod flow. Uh, we, have, we have goldenrod blooming from the 4th of July through late September, but he gets goldenrod nectar in like all of August into September. And I get zero, just my bone dry in august from goldenrod they're pulling in the pollen like crazy and they are for him too but i just get zero nectar and we live 10 minutes apart and then my other friend who lives eight minutes down the road she's got it worse off than i do like she her summer flows are even worse than me and she's only like four miles away or four and a half miles away and she gets considerably less nectar than i do so it's just wild how different it can be and when i was watching your video about the splits this morning um I was thinking, man, he's going to have to move those into new boxes pretty quick because they were so big. I couldn't, I, I, I could tell that it was going to happen really fast. Uh, of course, I recorded some stuff that I did today, but I, I cracked open the first split and I'm like thinking in oh, my no. mind, you know, now that I think about it, I could have, I have, I have t probably 18 or 20 nukes I could sell right now for 200 bucks. They just are beautiful, man. They're just packed with bees. And I made really strong splits. Um, some of the frames we put in there were just basically two to three frames of nothing but brood. So obviously, you know, the new queens haven't had a chance to get capped brood. Maybe they're starting to cap a little bit of it. But most of what's in there is brood that's emerged from the other hives they were in. But man, they are just slam packed. And, and um, I put them in 10 frame boxes. Now, the 10 frame boxes that they don't look near as impressive, obviously, because and, and but I did put a feeder and added three more frames mostly of just foundation so hopefully they'll they'll draw that out and then hopefully here in about about a month is about when the privet starts blooming and the spring stuff really kicks it off heavy hopefully they'll be about ready to start slapping some comb on and making honey and so uh, i'm pretty excited about it i've kept them all here this year and it's just been so much fun and um i really want to simplify i want to be basic and i don't want to try everything that everybody else is doing like you said i want to have a more uniform operation it's still not there yet. I've still got several yeah. that are like even in triple deep. So I, I, you know, about a month ago, I went in all these areas, even where I split uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, and I added a deep box. They were so packed with bees and brood everywhere. So I'm like, well, I'm going to add a deep box, mostly of drawn comb in those. So the idea was the queen would start laying in, in those two box, at least the bottom two boxes and maybe even the top box if there was room and i'll be darned if they didn't just move up immediately and start laying and so that's how i was able to pull those splits but now they're still packed they're still sitting in three deep di triple deeps and stuff i want to get them down to either single or at most double deeps i'm going to try to kind of phase out my deep and medium configurations that's a really good size for the bees but it's just so obnoxious to deal with un unequal size boxes in the brood yeah. anyway I, I really wanted to hit kind of your top three to five uh, things that you like or or ideas that you have uh of emphasis and i think those were all th uh, actually four very good things with the queens the mites the uh feeding and then of course the equalizing i've not been as good about equalizing over the years but i'm trying to get better at that it's been fun man i wanted to just kind of hit those points and i thought we'd talk a little bit more about your channel uh rainier go ahead and give us kind of some final thoughts tell us um what you want them to hear and uh then we'll talk about your channel a little bit and then we'll probably shut this yep. thing down 
I love beekeeping and I feel like I've learned so much over the past six years. And so I just feel so lucky to be connected with all these people like you, Bruce, and so many others. And um, I just hope I can express my passion because I really do love beekeeping and finding a way to share that with people is very valuable to me. I was, you know, helping out with bee class um, at bee school this morning. And uh, I, I love beekeeping and I know I'll never stop learning because you just can't will never ever learn it all in beekeeping. So I'm excited to keep learning. And since I'll be working for a commercial operation, I'll get, uh, you know, I'll be working bees 50 hours a week for the next, you know, six years or something. So yeah, I'm very excited. Sounds like is what you want to do for a career. It sounds Absolutely. like you want to go full time. So that's really cool. I wanted to talk a little bit about your channel, uh, Rainier, kind of, this will be almost like a timestamp kind of where you're at now and where you want to go with the channel. What are your goals? And uh, just tell us a little bit more about your channel. Yeah. So I started it last year um, in late uh, January. So I, there's a lot of beekeepers that do some videos while they're during the winter time up in the north and they, you know, just talk about bees. So that's kind of how my channel started. And I always know that I knew that I wanted to turn it into, you know, making beekeeping videos outside. So I did that and I, I gained some traction last spring, but I kind of trailed off into the summer because I just kind of lost, lost my passion for it. Uh, but I started up again this spring, my channel's, you know, just under 600 subscribers. And I, this week's been really good. I've gained like 90 subscribers in the last eight days or something. So it's been going really well as of late. Uh, what I want for the channel, I want it to be a place where beekeepers can educate, uh, or be educated and just talk with me. I'm always happy to kind of discuss any ideas or interesting, uh, propositions. I like to do my live chats every Saturday. And uh, just try to make videos that are even more in depth on people, uh, on topics that really interest people. And in the future, I would like to visit a lot of different beekeepers in Maine and across the country and uh, just kind of show what they do and, you know, maybe learn from them and integrate some of that into what I do. And just it's just interesting to see what other people do. So to put that out for my viewers and uh, be able to interact with them, I find very fulfilling. And so I hope, hope to grow the channel towards that. One reason I wanted to have you on is because I am impressed with your knowledge of beekeeping and I'm like, this channel needs to grow. <laughs> I watched the uh, live chat you did last night and it was just so well prepared. And I'm going to put a link to that in the description below. Uh, you, you need to go watch it. If you, if you're watching this video, if you're still watching it this time, uh, the viewers out there, go watch that video from Rainier. And uh, I think you'll be impressed with his knowledge of beekeeping. He basically goes through his entire year of beekeeping strategies just a lot of really great tips for anyone whether you're a brand new beekeeper or an experienced beekeeper you clean some stuff from that and so uh, obviously you know you mentioned a lot of dates and timestamps and things that are going to vary but the principles that you teach are are the same i mean they're they apply pretty much everywhere so i thought that was really good the reason i wanted you to go ahead and talk about your channel a little bit is because you know like you say you're just under 600 subscribers right now and uh it'll be interesting to see how it grows you know in the in the near future obviously things are slow youtube can be very frustrating it takes a while to gain some traction but just down the road whether it's a year four years eight years ten years i think you're going to look back at this and realize that there's a lot of growth to be had and don't don't give up if it's something you enjoy don't give up on it i mean if it's something you're just not passionate about, you don't enjoy it, then I, would cons I wouldn't recommend you continue to doing it. But if it's something you want to achieve and you want to get better at, yeah. you want to grow it, just continue to work at it and, and just plug along at your own pace. You've got to find your own your own way of doing things. You know, you, what I've done over the years is glean from a lot of other people, learn from a lot of other people, and then I kind of try to take that and, and uh, customize it to what who I am. You have to hold true to yourself. You know, the skills, the the videography, the, the editing, all those things will get better. I'm still working on all those things, but, but you just have to remain true to yourself. And what you want to do now is going to be completely different than what you want to do in three to four years. You know, I don't know about beekeeping, but in the, in the YouTube thing, it's going to be a totally different approach. It's always changing, but just don't be rigid and, and just continue to try to get a little better each day. You're going to do great. Do you have anything else you'd like to, to bring up before we close this thing out? I'm just happy to get these opportunities to meet all these people. Someday I'll go visit Bruce and bring him some queens so he can try out these, uh, you know, northern mutts. Um, so I mostly just thank you, Bruce. I really appreciate you having me on. And I just love talking to any beekeeper about bees because an hour spent talking about bees is one of the best hours you can spend, I, I think. Your name's going to be a household name in the beekeeping world, I think, in the future for sure. Uh, I know right now you're just kind of getting started with this journey, but you're, what, 18? 17 yeah, 18 man. now yeah 
you know, you got a lot, a lot of time left to, to really grow and, and do well. For all those who are watching this video, go check out Rainier's channel. And uh, I always tell folks Rainier with my channel too, if you like what you see, subscribe, hit the bell, whatever it is. And I, I usually don't even say that on my videos. I just have a little thing that pops up, but that's my opinion. If you don't care about what you see, or if you just like this one video, I don't, you don't have to subscribe to my channel because I want people who are gonna come back and become a part of my community. And so I appreciate everyone, but, but I'm really looking for folks that wanna be a part of, of the beekeeping community first and then a part of Bruce's Bees second. I think you're kind of in that same category right near. It's, it is about subscribers, but I think it's more about the community you're trying to build. Yeah, I mean, I'll ask people to subscribe, but I give specific reasons why, because sure. you know, if you're gonna subscribe after watching one video, like my friends will be like, oh, I'll make sure to subscribe to you. I'm like, I mean, you can do it if you want, but I know this isn't something you actually want. <laughs> so just like you, Bruce, I, yeah. I'm looking for people who wanna be a part of our community on YouTube and just the broader beekeeping industry. Be positive, help others, don't put each other down and just look to the future and you know, be excited because that's what beekeeping is for a lot of us. We're just really excited to keep going and keep learning. No doubt. And I, I mean, I'm not gonna turn anybody away if they wanna subscribe after watching one video, but I'm really looking for folks that are, that like what they see and, and wanna come back. So that's kind of what, what I'm hoping folks will wanna do. That's why I try to continue to improve the content to keep people coming back. So appreciate your time, man. I'm gonna let you go. Um, good luck with your bees. And if you have any more questions, maybe we'll have to do this again sometime. Sounds good to me. All right. Thanks. Take care. And uh, I know you're, you're waiting um, for that opportunity to get in those hives and, and I'm sure you're gonna have a great year this year. And uh, so we'll talk to you later right here. Thanks for coming on. All right, bye. Bye.